And Jermaine can have love for the truckie Beautiful minds, but we love getting ugly Risk takers with a clover, man, we love getting lucky You run, we chase fire, I love when it ducks me Tones go off, house watch, read the address out 1075, get up off the magic couch 500 gallons prepared for the baddest drought Who else you want on the way when disaster's Can't out? Can't even get a little bit rattled when you enter with exit apparel Mayday member down, they'll drag you you won't get this from every Tom, Dick, and Harold But here's a view from the top floor with Mickey Farrell Oh, no, Thanks for tuning in to another episode of A View from the Top Floor. Back in the studio after a long week and a half on the road doing some lecturing and training, but happy to be back. And that video we just saw, that is a video of an engine company in a small town in the Philadelphia region fighting a routine, quote-unquote routine, house fire. Engine stretching, knocking fire down, and then we have a lithium-ion battery, micro-mobility device, thermally loaded by the front door. That device fails, sending cells into the air, burning the line through and burning the firefighter that was on the line advancing that line. So let's talk about that fire and the backup line. For those of you that watch the video, that's watching the show, it looked like a pretty routine fire up until that point when that device failed. The backup line was not in place, but that's okay. We'll talk about that. Now, the book is written that, you know, the backup line is to back up the first engine company advancing until they're making forward progress, and then you can reposition that line on the fire ground where it's needed. I think the way we're going today in the fire service, I'm not so sure we should be committing that line anywhere. We have to be charged and ready, action-oriented. How many times throughout the years in the fire service, one-room fire maybe, we stretch the backup line, but it never gets charged. And how many times do we not stretch the backup line because the first line has it and it's a two-bit fire, 10 cents worth of fire, right? The game is changing. Now, I'm not saying we have to change our tactics with lithium-ion battery fires, but the devil is, in fact, in the details. And we have to be dialed in with an action-oriented forward progression understanding that these fires change rapidly. They're flashing over in seconds. Six to 12 seconds, these fires flash over. So the problem necessarily is not the lithium-ion battery or the micromobility device causing the fire, having that to seed the fire, the fire actually fighting. 
That's a problem too. But another problem is having these devices thermally loaded in the fire building, remote from the actual seat of the fire. Thermal runaway, in fact, is vulnerable at only 140 degrees to 275 degrees Fahrenheit. That's no more than a basic hot yoga class that some go to. So these temperatures in the fire building, we attain them and reach them on the fire floor and floors above. So that changes our exposure problems. And that's a whole different episode. We could talk about that another day. I want to stay focused on the backup line because I feel the backup line is something that we're losing sight of. And we've lost sight of the importance of the backup line even before these battery problems arose into the fire ground. So stretch that line charged and ready to go at every single fire. Because as we saw in the video, if you're watching the show, the engine's making progress, fire's being knocked down, and now that device is thermally loaded, failing at 302 degrees, putting cells into the air at 932 degrees, anywhere up to 1,800 degrees. Now, these are just numbers I'm throwing out there. What I'm getting at is that thermal runaway can be vulnerable at a very, very low temperature, but when it fails, it fails very, very rapidly at high explosive temperatures changing the tempo of the fire almost instantly. If you saw that video, you could hear how progression or progress was being made, progressing that line in, and then that device failed, cutting the line off, burning the line off, trapping firefighters inside. The tempo of that fire drastically, drastically changed. So at the command level, I think it's very important that we get that line in position, charged and ready, action-oriented, head on a swivel. Now, head on a swivel, it goes beyond just size up or situational awareness, a term that the fire industry loves to use. I like the term situational response and how we act under stress. That's how we perform on the fire ground. That's where we have to be, especially with the progression of how the fire service is trending with lithium ion battery fires. Very, very dangerous and rapid, rapid fires cutting not only civilians off, but in this situation, cutting firefighters off. So having that backup line ready to go, truly, truly backing up that initial line is critical in today's fire service. I don't think we need to necessarily change the tactics we've always done. We just have to spend some more detail with the way we do things, not overlooking the basics. Action-oriented head in a swivel. Yes, for the backup line, but let's talk about that initial engine company advancing that line. Now, I know it's not cool sometimes to wear your chin strap. Some guys don't wear their hood. I think we've gotten past the hood issue as we've gone towards the, towards the recent years in the fire service. But when those hoods were introduced, everyone fought them. And for some reason, people are still fighting the chin strap. I'll be honest, I fought the chin strap for, for years. But I made a conscious decision probably about 10 years ago to go back and learn how to use the chin strap. I feel the chin strap now is one of the most important parts of our, of our gear. When you're in the engine company and you're advancing that nozzle into the gates of hell and you lose that helmet, firemen die. There's case study after case study where firemen lose helmets and firemen die or get severely burned. We cannot put ourselves in that situation by being quote unquote cool or lazy in the moment. Chin strap and hood on, action oriented, ready to go to work. Because when these devices fail, not only are they the failing, causing the fire, they're failing remotely as a time bomb ticking in the fire building. We have to be ready to protect ourselves and to hang in there, to fight the fire. There was just a fire recently where someone sent me a photo of the actual nozzle bale handle was melted. Nozzle man got severely burned fighting a lithium ion battery fire. So it's not something that we're, we're talking about so much in a reactive state. We're kind of learning as we go. I think we're being proactive, but as you're being proactive, I think the odds are in our favor because if you stay to the basics and you wear your gear properly, consistency equals professionalism. Everything we do in this job, but having a systematic method of how we quickly and properly don our gear, that equals professionalism, not a paycheck. So understand that, that this may be, in the eyes of some, a big urban problem because it's on the news in the major cities, New York City, London especially two major cities where it makes the news almost daily. But that video you just saw, if you're watching the episode, small town right outside Philadelphia. So it's not an urban problem. And if you think it is, you're going to be surprised because eventually you're going to go to a fire and it's going to involve a lithium ion battery, not only causing the fire, but thermally loaded and cutting members off 
and pushing firefighters and civilians to windows. We have to be ready to operate. We have to be able to react in real time. Again, the tempo of these fires are very, very quick, very quickly. When these fail, there's zero time for reaction. Six seconds flash over. Where are you in the fire building when this happens? And are you prepared? There's some things to think about, some things to talk about. Uh, it's not necessarily a hands-on type drill we can do. However, we can drill on getting that backup line charged and ready and not overcommitting it in the fire building or into the adjacent exposures. That's something we'll talk about in another episode about how exposure problems are now changing because of these batteries being thermally loaded and where we operating on the floors above, could we be cut off? So there's a lot to talk about. I just want to jump back on back in the studio. And this has been something that not only I think about recently, I think about it quite often. Uh, for those of you that do follow my social media, I'm constantly posting lithium ion battery fires and I'm posting those fires just so you know, in real time. So you'll see three, four, 10 a day sometimes, sometimes you'll see none, but I don't go more than a week without posting a handful of fires and they're real. And they're not only in New York City, they're all over. I get the updates now and you, I can see where just in the matter of six to eight months, it's slowly progressively moving from that bullseye of New York City into the suburbs, moving farther and farther away. Before you know it, it'll be spread throughout the country. There's so many reasons why these batteries are causing fires. And that's a whole different topic. But what I want you to think about taking away from this episode is that it's not necessarily the batteries that are causing fires that are our problem. It's batteries that are thermally loaded in the fire building that could fail at any moment, cutting us off. And where are you in that fire building? Do you have your gear on properly? And can you react in time? All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. This is Mickey Farrell, and I'll see you on the next episode. <laughs>